the magic dragon lived by the sea. Hi everybody, hello Wotre! So today we want to talk about dragons. From a natural history perspective, you are a natural historian. I, I work at the Natural History Museum, so I'm a natural historian. Well, dragons are animals, so they have types of behavior and development yes. and things that we could analyze as if they are real animals. Right. Compare them yeah. to what's out there. And then we can learn about all kinds of animals and natural history of the real world. So that's the fun part of it. One of the first things that we learn about the dragons is that... They can never be tamed. But, as far as I can remember, it's as if Daenerys has domesticated them and they do whatever she wants to do. They don't work against her interests. If she wants to do one thing, they do it. If she wants to do another thing, they do that. So they are completely under control. Well, you, you said domesticated. She tamed them. Okay, what's the difference between taming and domesticating? Domesticating is more where you have animals whose breeding you also control so that they really, over time, start to become different from the wild types. Right. right? Exactly. So the way we domesticated cows, starting with this scary big animal, the aurochs, and it became our mm. cute, cuddly cows. Right. And, and we've done that dogs. with like wolves and dogs yeah. and so on. Yeah. And you can tame more animals than, than, than you can domesticate. Right. Can you domesticate uh, tigers? Probably not. But you can tame them. You could tame them. It would be dangerous, but you could. I could if I want to. <laughs> the success of both taming and domestication uh, also has a little bit to do with how these animals actually behave and what their social structure is. So for example, tigers are more solitary, right. which means they're actually harder to tame than lions. So you see more like a lion tamer okay. in the circus Why? than a tiger tamer. Why is it hard to domesticate a solitary animal? Uh, they are less likely to respond to social cues. Uh, and dragons, they are, even though there are three dragons uh, here in the story, they are solitary yeah. and they are not so. They are not very social. It's in right. the books, Daenerys is really actually taming Drogon. Uh, it's in the the battle pits. She comes in to save him because people are trying to kill him. And he's trying to kill her. He's burning her and she takes a whip and overpowers him and goes on top of him and just like, no, you're going to do this. So this is really different from the Drogo that we saw in the show. You could see some kind of symbiosis between uh, him and her as if it's just like uh, whatever. An aircraft or something. In the book, she really breaks him. Yes. The way you might break a wild horse. Most of our collaborations are actually not on video, but on podcasts. And we talk about history or science through very famous movies. Yeah. And we keep it light, we keep it interesting, we learn about history and about science. And they're very fun, so you should check them out. A lot of fun. The links are in the description. How about this uh, connection that she has with Drogon that is stronger than the connection that she has with the other dragons and nobody else can ride a dragon. Once it's yours, it will not accept a different rider. Yeah. Is that, does that have a natural history, uh, history uh, equivalent? A lot of animals have this ability when they're very young to respond to something and just assume, oh, this must be my mother. Actually, the word imprinting comes from a very famous experiment if you take young geese, uh, they have this sort of software in their head that is, okay, when you come out of the egg, the first thing that, that moves, that's mommy. Really? Right? So just follow that. Wow. And um, What about the gander? Is that also good for the gander? <laughs> Go on. <laughs> this behavior was demonstrated and named imprinting okay. by a guy named uh, Konrad Lorenz, who uh, we will show footage of him okay. here doing this with the geese. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> but like a lot of biologists, he was an enormous Nazi. Um, okay, I didn't see that one coming. Right. So, so why are we showing his picture? Get off! Get off! Conrad Lorenz, uh, uh, yeah, so he was like, he was serious Nazi. Like, he joined the Nazi well, party in 19, 1938 and he wrote his, in his application letter, oh no, no, all my research is actually to further the principles of National Socialism, la di da di da. Uh, later in life, he got Nobel Prize for his behavior uh, or for his um, research in behavior. Not his Not behavior. For his behavior. <laughs> he was awarded the Nobel Prize for being a top Nazi. <laughs> no, um, but it was a joint Nobel Prize together with uh, a, a Dutch uh, biologist, Nico Tinbergen. Who was a collaborator uh, no, of no. this Nazi. And, and the third, well, they collaborated on the research, so ah. it, was, uh, it was a shared Nobel Prize. Konrad Lorenz, Nico Tinbergen and von Fries. And uh, the uh, working relationship with, between Lorenz and Tinbergen, Tinbergen was very difficult because Tinbergen had actually been uh, a prisoner of war ah, okay. under I the apologize. Nazis. So he was okay. not a collaborator. They were scientific collaborators, he was not Sorry. a collaborator Take it anymore. Back. Take my joke back. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the Tinbergers are really weird. Like his brother also got a Nobel Prize for economics. It's the only case where two brothers both get a... Actually, there's three brothers. Two of them each got a Nobel Prize. Uh, the third uh, one... Homeless. Yeah, no, he was also <laughs> quite smart, it says on Wikipedia. Awesome. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, yeah, no, my brothers both have a Nobel Prize. I don't. <laughs> If one brother has a Nobel but Prize. That's still, then he's the one special one, but now you're the, the one dumbass who did not get a Nobel Prize. You never hear the end of it. So another thing about, about this imprinting, tell me if this is also part of the imprinting, in Fire and Blood, in the history of the, of the Targaryens, that they put uh, the eggs, dragon eggs, with, uh, with a child, and then they become his or hers even before they are born, and then they are born, like they grow up together, is this also part of the imprinting? Perhaps they hear things uh, through the eggshell or something. Then how about when Daenerys gets the eggs? We haven't seen a dragon for 150 years. She has the eggs, she puts them in the fire, boom. A lot of people put eggs, uh, dragon eggs in, uh, in fire. They weren't born. Mm. So why, what makes this special outside of an explanation titled Magic. In a bunch of different species, for example, being activated by fire or by something else, and then all of a sudden things start developing. That okay. occurs. So, for example, with uh, sequoias, big redwood trees, cones, when there's a forest fire, then the cone bursts open. And, and it, it's a very good strategy because all the other undergrowth is uh, burnt up and then they sprout, so just, these cones are lying on the ground waiting for fire. This uh, is a very bad incentive to create havoc, okay. Yeah. Go on. It occurs quite a lot in fishes that live in ponds that periodically dry up. So they lay their eggs in the mud, the pond dries up, the eggs stay dormant, and then next time where there's the big rains and the pond fills up, Huh. Then the eggs start to develop. They have a mechanism? Yeah. Okay. So maybe here it's fire, but with a Targaryen hand of, uh, of some sort. I suppose that's the magic part. Dracarys. Up the magic dragon. Uh, there's a clear uh, cultural uh, evolution. Like when the Valyrians started uh, realizing that they were that they were able to tame dragons, they were first like uh, herders, sheep herders. Then like, oh my goodness, I can tame the most powerful uh, animal uh, the world has ever seen. So that has shaped their entire culture, and in many ways they assumed the the nature and the character of the dragons. They became aggressive. Finally, the Valyrians marched on their capital, Old Gis, and obliterated it turning its streets and buildings to ash with dragon flame and wiping the Giscari people and their culture off the face of the earth. Oppressive, like we are better than everybody else. Expansive, they needed more room. Very competitive with each other. And uh, we've discussed it and uh, he has also said it's true. There are a lot of uh, parallels between Valerians and uh, Romans, mm -hmm. and the uh, Roman Empire. When in the case of the Romans specifically, 
maybe not domesticating and taming, but certainly capturing in the wild these very dangerous predators and use them to execute people, right, in the circus. Is this an example where the cruelty of the Romans manifests by them using these animals or vice or versa? If I have these predators, what am I going to use them for? Right. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so cultures that have tamed dangerous animals mm. and maybe used them in warfare in some ways identify with those animals. Okay. Of course, there's uh, like these horseback cultures which kind of look down their noses on cultures that are more sedentary, which they might consider more weak. But also things such as war elephants and oh, isn't this mighty and dangerous? For example, Alexander the Great, in sort of the myths surrounding yeah. him, in his youth, he tames this very dangerous, very big horse, Bucephalus, which nobody else could break. And then once he does that, mm -hmm. then his father says to him something like, oh, you need you know, a, a kingdom as, that is going to be so big that it matches your abilities and the abilities of this horse which you just broke into, right. something like that. And then he wouldn't stop. And then he wouldn't stop until the horse dies in somewhere in Pakistan and that is near the end of his campaigns, in fact. Um. So, they're, so they're quite closely linked. So Caesar had a horse, a genitor. The priests in Rome had said something like, whoever rides this horse is going to be you know, unbeatable. Okay. And, and so Caesar prevented everyone else from getting on the horse because this was the horse that, for example, was the one that he rode on when he crosses the Rubicon okay. and when he really starts to go imperial. Okay, okay. So we, we also want to talk about uh, dragons in cultures, how they're prevalent in uh, cultures across the world who haven't really communicated with each other. So we'll throw that up on Patreon. So if you want to watch that, go to patreon.com slash Academy. And I'll put a specific link in the description for that specific exclusive part of the conversation. And that's it for now. Boom. Okay. Oof, oof. Thank you everybody for watching. I will see you all next time. Bye. notre seule mine, je notre seule consigne. Je laisse trop sa vite. Je la passe à Pilatoire.